Hello, and welcome to the fourth Anatomy and Physiology Journal Club. My name is Professor Sheldahl. I teach 200 level anatomy at Mount Hood Community College. Today, I'd like to discuss a recent publication in the field of learning and memory, wherein the authors used a rather nifty technique called optogenetics to control mouse brains and influence how they generated short-term and long-term memories. Once we've discussed that, I would like to go on to talk about how the technique of optogenetics might be useful in the near future to treat certain human conditions, such as certain forms of blindness and potentially even chronic pain. This is the article that I'd like to cover today. The researchers investigated a couple parts of the brain that we learned about in second term anatomy, namely the hippocampus and the amygdala, and how those are important in the formation of long-term memories. What's unique about this publication is that the authors used a technique called optogenetics to activate specific neurons in the cortex and seemingly activate long-term memories that the mouse hadn't had a chance to learn yet. Now that seems like the stuff of science fiction, and because of that, many non-scientific publications have been writing articles about this specific publication. So let's take a look at this one in a little bit more detail. At its most basic, this current publication covers a number of things that we learned in second term anatomy class. Now, the authors were studying mice, but let's assume that it works the same way in mice as it does in humans. We have primary sensory cortex in our post-central gyrus. This region of the brain gets activated when we detect some sort of stimulus, such as an electric shock that we get when we walk down the left side of a T-shaped maze. This information can trigger a behavior. We might uh, jump or re react in pain. But it would be helpful to remember this information in the future so that we could avoid such noxious stimuli. To do this, we rely on a pair of deep forebrain structures known as the hippocampuses. These structures are what are responsible for consolidating memories, meaning when we convert them from a short-term memory into a long-term memory. We learned from our patient HM that if you destroy both of the hippocampuses, that you are not able to form any new long-term memories, but that all of the old long-term memories remain untouched. This suggests that long-term memories are not stored in the hippocampus, but the hippocampus is required for the formation of long-term memories. Today, what we will see is that the hippocampus can communicate to other brain regions out in the cortex and induce changes there that ultimately lead to long-term memory formation. And then just the memory of the left side of a T intersection can trigger a behavior, such as freezing and stopping before we get that electric shock that we remember from a few weeks ago. What is unique about this paper is that we don't rely on old-fashioned techniques of going in and chopping out regions of the brain and asking what happened. Instead, the researchers were able to directly control, meaning turn on and turn off individual neurons in both the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex to see how that affected the formation of both short-term and long-term memory. Before we move on, there's one other important brain region today that can help us to decide what sort of information is important enough to remember and what could be easily forgotten. And that is another basal ganglial structure called the amygdala, which is responsible for, among other things, our sense of fear and displeasure. Because in most regions of the brain, we are not capable of growing new neurons, 
to make the changes necessary to create a long-term memory, we must instead increase the strength of connections that already exist. In this naive state, let's imagine we have a neuron in the amygdala that is capable of causing us to freeze in place. Connected to the dendrites of this neuron in the amygdala are axon terminals coming from thousands of other neurons. These connections at this point in time are random and don't really make any sense. But let's say one of them is activated when we turn left down the maze. Initially, this neuron needs some help to stimulate the second one, and that help came from the electric shock. But ultimately, we want this neuron, representing the memory of turning left in the maze, to be able to trigger a behavior on its own. And so what we can see is that axon terminals grow in this neuron, and that the receiving neuron grows more dendritic spines. And ultimately now, we've got an increased number of connections between this first neuron that will represent our memory and this second neuron, which mediates the freezing behavior. When the first neuron fires the same action potential, it will now release a whole lot more neurotransmitter from all of those new axon terminals. And the receiving neuron will receive more neurotransmitter and have more ligand-gated ion channels activated. This will create a bigger graded potential, allowing the second neuron to be activated by the first neuron in a way that did not occur in the naive state. So that is our current theory of how memories are formed in the brain. It's based off of some rather indirect studies, namely chopping out regions of the brain or hitting the brain with a number of drugs to try and block these processes from happening. The authors, however, wanted to look at things a little bit more carefully and manipulate individual cells. In order to do that, they used a technique called optogenetics, wherein you genetically engineer specific cells so that they respond to light. And that takes advantage of some of the proteins that we learned about in second term anatomy, uh, the rhodopsin proteins. Rhodopsin, if you remember, is a G protein coupled receptor, meaning a cell surface receptor that is connected to a second messenger known as a G protein. In the eye, rhodopsin can respond to light, activating a G protein, which then activates a phosphodiesterase, which degrades cyclic GMP, and then that in turn closed off an ion channel, hyperpolarizing the cell. This was not entirely useful to the authors because the cells they want to manipulate don't have the same G protein or phosphodiesterase or cyclic GMP gated ion channel. So instead, they relied on a different type of light sensitive molecule called a channel rhodopsin. This is also sensitive to light, but in response to light, this one opens and allows ions directly into the cell. So this is a bit simpler than our second messenger system. Channel rhodopsin can let in negatively charged ions, which would hyperpolarize the cell. And there are other versions which allow in cations, allowing the authors to depolarize cells with the simple flick of a switch. Using a virus, the DNA for these genes can be inserted into specific neurons. Of course, it's pretty dark inside of the skull, but implanting LEDs allowed the authors to pulse these neurons in a very controlled fashion, and either stimulating or inhibiting them in response to light.
So the authors added these new techniques to fairly standard learning experiments, wherein you train a mouse that if it moves down the left side of a maze, it gets a little electric shock. The authors discovered that this information was sent to the hippocampus, and from the hippocampus, this information was relayed both to the amygdala and to regions of the cortex. The amygdala could trigger the initial behavior of fear and avoidance, but changes in the cortex ultimately led to the formation of a long-term memory. And later, the memory of the maze was able to activate the amygdala, which activated the behavior of freezing and avoiding in the absence of a shock. What the authors first report is actually very similar to what we already knew from patient HM, namely that if you destroy the hippocampus, you destroy the ability to form new long-term memories, but you don't damage any of the old long-term memories that had been previously formed. These new techniques do offer a twist to that old story, though. First, the authors had to identify the specific neurons that were undergoing changes, then genetically engineer them, and then when they inhibited neurons in the hippocampus, they found that, sure enough, the long-term memory couldn't form. If you inhibited the hippocampus right off the bat, this also blocked the formation of the short-term memory. Namely, the mouse wouldn't remember two days after the shock that the left side of the maze was a bad idea. Now, next, the authors inhibited the neurons out in the cortex, and what they found was the mouse was able to remember the shock two days later, but not two weeks later, reinforcing our belief that memories are consolidated and stored out in the cortex. However, if you train the mouse, and a few weeks later you inhibit the hippocampus, this had no effect on the memory. It had already been consolidated, and you no longer needed the hippocampus once changes had been made to the cortex. Where this study really gets cool is not in the blocking of memory formation, but in the activation of memories. So we still had to train the mouse. We had to shock it. On day one, that information from the hippocampus was sent to the amygdala and the cortex, and then it would take a couple weeks for those changes to occur out in the cortex. But what if you didn't want to wait two weeks? So the authors, using their genetic engineering, were able to directly stimulate the cell out in the cortex on day two, a time where this neuron should not have had any of the changes occur to it. Yet activating this neuron was able to activate the behavior that we would expect after the long-term memory had been consolidated. Namely, we train the mouse on day one, on day two we directly stimulate this neuron in the cortex, and no matter where this mouse is located, it freezes as if it remembers something. So have we created a memory? Is this going to lead to mind control eventually? I don't think so. We still had to teach the mouse on day one. Genetic engineering allowed us to rush ahead a couple of weeks. We could directly activate the cell rather than waiting for all of the cellular changes, those growth of dendritic spines and axon terminals to occur. This cell is not always going to be the same cell in every brain, not even for mice, and certainly not in humans. So I don't think we'll ever be able to directly stimulate a human neuron and generate a specific memory. Maybe a random one, I don't know, or maybe just part of a behavior which seems more than likely. Nevertheless, this experiment reinforces our theory of how memories are formed in the brain. Namely, we require the hippocampus initially, but the hippocampus directs cellular changes out in the cortex, the growth of dendritic spines and axon terminals, for instance. Once those changes are made, this is now what we think of 
as a long-term memory. Now, that's all very good from an academic perspective, but what about from a biomedical perspective? And from there, we're going to forget the brain and instead focus on this technique of optogenetics, genetically engineering cells to respond to light and then controlling their behavior with impulses of light from an LED implant. The first place that the technique of optogenetics has been utilized in humans is, perhaps not surprisingly, in the retina. Certainly we can imagine that giving cells the ability to respond to light in the retina could be very useful for people with certain forms of blindness. Let's review our retinal physiology though first. In the deepest layer of the retina, I've got the rods and the cones. I've drawn them all to look like cones here just for simplicity's sake. It's the rods and cones that actually respond to light. Photons hitting these cells can lead to changes in action potential frequency. These signals are sent to the next layer of cells, the bipolar cells, which in turn synapse on the most superficial layer of cells, the retinal ganglion cells. It's the axons of the retinal ganglion cells that make up the optic nerve and send information from the retina to the brain. Now this particular pattern may look a little bit familiar to you in that I've tried to draw an on-center ganglion cell, meaning that this ganglion cell is only going to respond when the bipolar cell in the center is activated and the ones on the edges are inactivated. That's when this cell would fire an action potential and the brain would detect light. This would be at the border of an object when things go from light to dark. In the condition retinitis pigmentosa, the light detecting cells are lost, leading to blindness. In a phase one trial, the technique of optogenetics has been used to bring the light detecting channel rhodopsin instead to these bipolar cells, making these light sensitive. Now this will not restore normal vision. However, it could bring the ability to detect light to people who are blind. This technique would not work for people whose blindness is caused by damage to the optic nerve or regions of the brain. Nevertheless, it's very exciting, and it's past phase one trials, meaning it's been shown to be safe. The next step will be a phase two, and then potentially a phase three trial, wherein the technique is shown to be effective at restoring the ability to detect light to people whose retinas have lost that ability. One more area that the technique of optogenetics has shown promise is in the treatment of chronic pain. It's possible that we could genetically engineer neurons to respond to light, specifically to allow the inhibition of neurons in response to the flick of a switch controlling an LED. This has the potential to be able to shut down neurons that are triggering painful stimuli when they shouldn't be. This is pretty exciting. I have been trying to convince my best friend that he needs to sign up for trials so that I can say I've got a cyborg friend, but he hasn't done it yet. All jokes aside, there are a number of considerations and complications when trying to introduce DNA into human cells that wasn't there in the first place. And there's also potential complications when using viruses that can potentially spread and multiply to do this as well. Nevertheless, I find this a very exciting area of research. So if you'd like to learn more, why not check out one of these fine publications?
Otherwise, until next time, this has been Professor Sheldahl. Thanks for watching.